people often want to die how they've lived and we shouldn't expect that to be any different for somebody living in homelessness. They're very well resourced in in their resiliency and their survival factor and their independence and the last thing we should want to do is to take that away right at the end of life when that seems to be the only thing that they have left. We just feel very strongly in our hearts that, that people, those people who have suffered so greatly throughout their life deserve some dignity and the respect that every Canadian would expect at the end of life and, and I think we just have to find novel ways and novel approaches of dealing with people who see life in a different way and have lived that life in a different way and want to die and be treated in a different way. You know we know that somebody living in homelessness is more likely to to die young, right? Their average life expectancy is, I think, 54 years. So, you know, we already know that they're dying 20 years earlier. So, you know, now with the palliative focus, it's almost easier to have discussions about, you know, goals of care designation. Like, what, is, what does a person want if they were to become unconscious, right? It's almost a bit easier to, to have those conversations because it's, it's part of that palliative, palliative role, right? You know, we find people, a lot of what we do is just try to locate people, right? So if somebody's sort of been off the radar or, you know, they've had appointments and they haven't checked in, then, then we will go and sort of cold call to where they are last known to be staying or, you know, where they hang out. So Virgil, actually, he's somebody that I've known for a really long time and certainly is way more vulnerable when he's not housed and he's out on the street. So there is a big group of people that hang out at the, at the Walmart, probably because there's a warm mall that they can hang out in. There's McDonald's close by, it's near a LRT station, right? So I'll drive by there every now and again and just make sure that, that he's there and he's doing well. And, and he does the same for me, right? He'll check and make sure that I'm okay too, which is really lovely. I think, you know, just seeing that familiar face sometimes is really, really important to know that people care enough to go looking for a person when, you know, they've been missed and um, that people are still working behind the scenes to get things done. So just touching base and making sure that, that people know that and that they know we're still there and we're going to still be there and we're going to keep being there. So that's, that's important. CAMP stands for Calgary's Allied Mobile Palliative Programme. Uh, it was formed in 2016. The things that we were noticing at that stage, and particularly personally for myself, were, were things like the disparity um, of care when someone was dying and homeless. Initially it was quite easy to, to settle their symptoms in hospital, but things really unraveled when they were discharged and that often caused uh, a very quick readmission. Um, it's the expectation is that people have either family members or they have loved ones to look after them and uh, it's very clear with uh, homelessness and vulner vulnerability in general that uh, the support systems aren't in place. Oh, I just, um, I was going to see the nurse actually, oddly enough, and I couldn't make it. So I turned around and went up the stairs and I just lost my breath and my tight chest just went super tight and I was drooling and spewing phlegm and, and that's all I know and the next thing I know I was in the hospital and got diagnosed with uh, lung cancer, bone cancer and spinal cancer and I went to another clinic and they told me it was the flu. That's a far cry from the flu. Uh, Barbie was exactly the type of person that we had in mind when we were thinking of camp. I had been connected to her when she was in, in the hospital, um, but camp was not actually officially formed at that stage. She would have been a perfect person for camp. 
Ironically, I was unaware that a, a movie had already been made documenting her sort of end of life journey. It's a tough go, you know. I'm a tough bitch. Yeah, well, the, most people are settled and have a home and they have, they have insurance. And, and it's scary not having the insurance, um, not having money to make doctor's appointments. You fail to make one appointment, it sets back another appointment with an oncologist, it sets back another appointment, appointment with, with say, cysts and, and lymph nodes that have to be taken care of all in a row. And there was, I definitely felt the frustration of her, you know, repeated admissions and the fact that she'd had to live with kind of pain and suffering. Um, despite being able to kind of get her under control when she was in the hospital, it just seemed to to unravel when she was discharged because she really struggled to deal with her medications, to deal with her symptoms, to have someone looking out for her. Um, she was a lady who'd been homeless for a long time and uh, really we, I found personally that was starting to really impact her at the end of life. There was a frustration that she was losing her independence and she wanted to be on the street but she was no longer able to be in the street. Uh, so when I was looking after Barbie, I had the privilege of looking after her in the final days, a couple of days. She came in really, really unwell. Um, it was her last admission. It was pretty clear that she was not going to get out of hospital again. And just before she died, probably um, a few hours before she died, I was just really curious about what we could have done differently or what, what her journey was like or how did she see her journey and I think she basically said in that moment she said to me you know you really have to make sure you can do things better for people like me in the future. I would say camp is very much remains very much in her memory and it's a strong reason why we, we developed the program um, and I think definitely Barbie's legacy and Barbie's uh, shadow pervades all the way through our camp program and I would like to hope that I'm honoring her wishes actually. I feel my life is full. Um, I don't really have nothing to look forward to but, but leaving this, this documentary behind and, and hoping that I can better um, another woman's situation or, or any homeless people for that matter because it's not easy being here. But I just live day for day and just hope that um, I live every day as happy as I can, um, no matter where I'd be. My name's Sean. It's with a W. The type of cancer I have, to my knowledge, it's called a GIST. It's a tumor. Less than 5% of the people who get cancer get this type of cancer. Twice a week, I have to come to CUPS to see the nurse. So uh, actually when camp first started, I think that's kind of when you were first diagnosed, yeah. right? And um, and so the nurses over at the drop-in centre kind of put him on, on our radar and uh, we met Sean over at the drop-in centre with Dr. Colgan and I. And like, that, like I said, that diagnosis was really new at that time and so we just kind of wanted to touch base um, with Sean and let him know, that, you know, what, what we could offer. Initially, it was it was sort of things like coordinating with the Tom Baker and you know seeing when appointments were coming up and that sort of thing. It's just challenging if you don't have a phone or you know a place to to stay where you can reliably get messages and stuff. So it was kind of figuring out some of those things, and then um, you know once sort of the pain kind of came onto the radar, in that it was changing a little bit, then we we started trying new things to manage manage that pain. You know, it's it's an ongoing process, right? So the relationship and the assessments are, are ongoing and, and as things change, we rely on Sean to let us know, you know, that this is working or this isn't working and, and how do we how do we fix it? How do we make that better? And um, so again it's a lot of that liaising between myself or, you know, if home care were involved or something like that, kinda of getting all, all the players on the same page. Again, making sure that it's Sean's voice and wishes that are that are heard throughout that. So I hope that's what what we accomplish.
and there's other places where they don't want to sleep. Like the choice, the choice areas are against the wall there. When I stay at the mustard one, seed, two hundred one, because you're even right though I've got the outside, 340, right? 350 got other, other people staying there with me, they could be different people every night. We've That's asked okay. about housing. Yeah. And oh, he's yeah. like, oh, yeah, if you can find a place for me and 300 of my, yeah. my roommate. That's but. not a problem, yeah. <laughs> if so we'd need bunk beds. <laughs> I don't know. Psychologically, I'd have a harder time on my own, in my own place. It would be... I don't know if I would respond as well, if I do respond well, to whatever type of treatment that I'm given when I'm with them, like those people. Hey. It, it was extremely, extremely hard for me to, to realize, to understand that I'm not going to be here. You know what I mean? Like I've got no family that that likes me, like nothing. You know what I mean? I'm all by myself. I live in a homeless shelter. I've got nothing. Sometimes, when I'm out at the seed, at the mustard seed, at their shelter, sometimes I have to go way in the back where the lights aren't aren't on, and go underneath a blanket. I cry from the pain, and I don't want anybody to see that. So I, I make sure, hopefully, that nobody does. Because when I come back out from underneath the blanket, I make sure that there's no tears. And I try to make sure that people want to talk to me, that people want me to be involved with whatever they're doing. So there's no tears, there's just a big happy smile. I'm dying. I don't, I'm, the road, the road that I'm on right now, even even if there's a fork in the road and I take this this way as opposed to that way, it's still a cul-de-sac. It's still a dead end. I'm hitting the end. You know what I mean? And that's fine. I walk. You know what I mean? That's how that's how I pass my time. I walk. I think that if everybody had the opportunity that Simon and I have to chat with people and to talk with people and you know it does take time to do that which not everybody has the privilege of time certainly in the hospital setting and and things like that but we do and and we're the lucky ones that get to have those interactions with people right we're privileged to sit with them and to have conversations that are really deep and you know, really get to the heart of where, who a person is and where they're at in their life and, and what their wishes are. I don't think you will often hear the wishes of people, the true kind of uh, soul type of wishes that people have until you develop a relationship. And that's where you hear things such as, well, this is what I really want. I want to die by the river. Or I want to, um, you, you ask about where we should go with camp, I think, um, being able to deliver some of those end-of-life wishes in nature, I think, is a, is a huge thing that I would like to get into. We always have to be cognizant of the fact that it's not just about controlling symptoms, it's about um, end-of-life is much more than that. It's about, it's about your legacy, it's about your soul, it's about the things that are important that make you the person you are and the human that you are. And actually, you know, when all, the, all your facade has dropped and you're you know, you're, you're at the end of your life and you're dying, I find people are much, much more real. It's very, very hard to hide when you're, when you're, when you're dying, you know? The stuff that, that overwhelms us all, the stuff that's unnecessary sort of disappears and it's the really important stuff like, who are the people I love? Who are the people that I want around me? What are the values that I hold dear? 
Um, what does my life mean to me? Um, it's very, very powerful to watch other people go through that.